Great to have you with us this weekend. Glad you're here. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, and just hold that. Uh, I want to welcome our online campus. So glad you're with us out at Etiwanda Gardens. Glad you're joining us. Lone Hill Fireside Room as we all come into this place together. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. In 1988, cardiologist Randolph Bird of the San Francisco Memorial Hospital did a landmark study on intercessory prayer. It was a respected study because it met all the criteria. And here's what he did. He took 393 patients out of the coronary care unit of the hospital, divided them into two groups. First group that consisted of 192 patients. He assigned people to pray for them all over the U.S. Now, they didn't know they were being prayed for. So they were involved in intercessory prayer, and they didn't even know it. Somebody somewhere in the U.S. was praying for them while they were in the coronary care unit. The other group... Uh, 201 patients did not receive prayer from anybody in the organization. They, I mean, obviously they didn't walk up to say, hey, we just wanted you to know that you are not being prayed for. It didn't work like that. <laughs> they simply said, 192 patients assigned intercessory people who would pray. 201 did not pray. Again, this was well-respected, well-documented, went out all over national news. The statistical variance was significant, if not miraculous. Here's what they discovered, that patients who were not prayed for were twice as likely, over 50%, more likely to suffer complications, twice as likely to suffer heart failure, three times more likely to require diuretics or suffer pneumonia, and five times more likely to need antibiotics. It was amazing. I read that, and you know, I've spent my life as a pastor wondering why it's difficult to get people to enter into regular, sustained prayer. And uh, if you think of it, I mean, it's like if someone were to tell you, hey, you've got an audience with God for 15 minutes, and you say, no, you know what, I'm kind of busy next Tuesday. I don't think I can do that. Or somebody tell you, you get, you're invited to the Oval Office to meet the president. You've got a half hour with the president. You say, sorry, man, I think I'm mini-golfing that day. I don't think I can make it. Even if you don't like the president, you get 30 minutes to talk to the president about what you don't like. If you love him, you get 30 minutes to talk about what you do like. It's like me as a golfer having an hour with Tiger Woods and turning it down to talk about the golf swing. The testimonies of prayer and the power of prayer over individual lives are so well documented. It goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years. And yet, it's still one of the most difficult things for us to do regularly with any kind of discipline whatsoever. There are stories and stories about how prayer has been able to sustain people in the midst of horrific atrocities. You think of Corrie ten Boom again, her great book, The Hiding Place. Most of us are familiar with the statement she made that no pit of despair is so deep that God's love is not deeper still. But we forget what she wrote a few lines above that when she said, prayer brings God near during the most difficult of circumstances. There have been people in concentration camps during the Holocaust, atrocious situations that have not only been able to survive these and live to tell about it, but to actually thrive in the midst of them because of prayer. We read those stories, we hear them. I remember reading about uh, Norman uh, Schwarzkopf, General Norman Schwarzkopf, during the Persian Gulf War. Uh, he went on record to say, and remember, here's a general that had access to the greatest firepower known to man up till that time. And even as the missiles were going out to hone in on their targets, he went on record to say that he was on his knees in prayer. Prayer has been known to change the course of history, transform the lives of individuals, save entire nations as it did under Joseph, and call people out of the mundane existence into extraordinary living. As a matter of fact, prayer has even been known to change the weather, something that people in the Midwest take for granted, I think. James chapter 5 Elijah was a man like us. In other words, there was nothing special about him. He was just like you and me. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the Bible says the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, folks, that is done in two minutes. I could stand here for hours and tell you about the stories, how the Reformation occurred in prayer. Revivals of the past have occurred, not at great preaching, but at great prayer. God has moved in the world because his people came and they began to pray and he heard and he released his divine energy into individuals, into entire governments, into entire countries and in our world. So why don't we pray? Why, don't, why aren't we like the Apostle Paul when he said, pray without ceasing? Your, your whole life is a life of walking, talking with God. Why don't we go to God's throne with great boldness and courage, believing that God will hear us and will act? 
Why don't we go with passionate prayers to God, motivated by a burden of the heart, thinking that God will actually do something? Now, if you'd asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have probably said something like this. Well, we're busy. We live in the Western world. Who has 15 minutes to do anything, really? Especially sit and ponder in quietness. For a lot of us, I think we do want to pray. And I think we hear sermons on prayer, and we get motivated for a while. And then we get lost in the silence. What am I supposed to be doing? Is anybody really hearing me? What's going on here? I mean, is there really, I know there's God, but does he really care? Ten years ago, I would have mentioned those things. Today, I go back to James 1 when James says, when you pray or when you ask God anything, you got to believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, is James saying, if you ask God for anything and you believe you'll get it? No, this is not a name and claim it passage. It's not saying, if you ask God for a new Mercedes, it will be yours. If you don't doubt, you're going to get it. That's not what he's saying. James is saying, there are some uncertain, listen, there are some uncertainties in your mind that you don't mouth, you don't verbalize, but they're there. And until you learn to deal with them, you will never experience prayer the way you want to experience and the way God wants you to experience. There are uncertainties we never talk about. For instance, we're uncertain about to whom we're really praying. You say, oh, well, no, I'm not praying to God. Yeah, but what is God really like? Well, I mean, what does he care about? What are his hobbies? Who is this guy? You've got to resolve that in your mind before you ever start to pray. We're uncertain about whether or not our little lives really matter in the bigger scheme of things. I mean, after all, there's world hunger, there's poverty, there's war and death. I don't think it really matters much to God that I can't make my car payment at the end of the month. Those are uncertainties you've got to deal with. We're not sure we deserve to be heard. After all, what about that sin I committed yesterday or just five minutes ago? We're all sinners in the room, right? Everybody, the people on the stage, the people out there. So there's a part of us that says, you know, I, I just thought I'm not worthy to go into the presence of God because I sinned last week or yesterday or a few minutes ago or some of the words you had with your wife on the way to church this morning, just those words. And so we think, why pray? I'm struggling with this addiction. So I'll clean myself up, then I'll pray. Yeah, good luck. But then there's a big one. Isn't the future fixed anyway? Doesn't God know everything's going to happen and it's already fixed? So what good is my prayer? I mean, does it really do anything? Really? Until you resolve those questions in your mind, you will never pray the way God intended and the way you want to. You have got to make some resolutions. The double-mindedness has to go. You don't have to have perfect faith, but there are some things you must resolve. And James says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Not doubt what? Let me help you with this. Let me help us with this. A few years ago, I read a book called Man in the Mirror. I think Pat Morley wrote the book. And it has a story in it that I've used many times. And every time I think about prayer, I think about this story. It's the four fishermen who went up to an Alaskan bay uh, fishing for salmon in the icy cold waters there. And they caught the mother load. There were four of them, one of whom was Dr. Littleford. And he had a son named Mark who was 12 years old. He had to accompany them on the trip. So they got all these salmon that they had caught and they loaded them up on the boat, then loaded them on the plane. They were so happy about what had happened. They took off and they did not recognize that the pontoon on the left side of the plane had filled with water. And so they no sooner took off, they nosedived back into the icy waters of the Alaskan Bay. They were too far from shore uh, to really do anything other than swim for their lives. And they began to swim in those icy cold waters, true story, but they were swimming against the current and it was fierce. Three of the men made it to shore after swimming with all they had. They looked back and they saw something that would mark them for the rest of their lives. They saw Dr. Littleford who could have made it to shore and saved his own life, but his son Mark was too weak to make it and he couldn't carry him. So Dr. Littleford just grabbed his son Mark, held him in his arms. They both drifted out to the icy waters and they died together so his son would not have to die alone. Please listen to me. The God you worship is not the God of Eastern mysticism. There's no God inside you. There's no God down deep inside you and you know it. The God you serve is not the God of Buddhism, a God that tries to seduce you into believing that your emotions are not real, that reality is not real, and if you just deny yourself everything, you may find peace in this life. God is not the God of Hinduism and 330 million different gods. God is not the God of Islam. Allah is not personal. 
and he is unattached, and he is unrelatable. Ask any Muslim, he will tell you it is the will of Allah. Your prayers don't really matter. You may feel holy. It may give you a sense of somewhat peace, but in the reality, the God Allah is unrelatable. He is impersonal. This is not the God of the Bible. It is not the picture of God that the Bible paints. Yes, God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is self-existing. He doesn't depend on anything outside of himself for his own existence. Therefore, nothing he has created has power over him. Yes, the Bible says he's omnipresent. David says in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go east, you're there. If I go west, you're there. If I go north and south, you are always there. And David says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to imagine. Yes, Yes, God is omnipresent. Yes, God is omnipotent. Yes, God is omniscient. Hebrews chapter 4 says, Nothing in creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. But tell me something. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. Does that comfort you and encourage you to pray? Think about it for a second. He knows everything you've ever done. He knows every thought you've ever had. And he knows every place you've ever been because whether you realize it or not, he's right there with you. But thank God. God is unique in one area. No other God claims this or even understands it. God is also love. There are four Greek words in the Bible describing love. There's agape, unconditional love. There's phileo, friendship love. There's eros, which is an erotic type of love, romantic love. And then there's storge, a paternal or maternal type of love. The two words the Bible uses to describe the love of God for you, well, stay with me, you have got to resolve this if you ever hope to pray, are the two words storge and agape, that God is your Father who loves you and will never stop loving you. Now go to Romans, he says it like this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Do you see Paul's point? He's saying that God doesn't just love you now, he always will love you. There's nothing happening outside you that can separate you from the love of God. He is your father. Chaos. Tsunamis, earthquakes. That we can grapple with. But Paul is saying there's nothing happening inside you that can ever change the fact and reality that God loves you. Nothing happening outside. Nothing. The Lord of the universe loves you now and will love you in the future. You say, how can he do that? He doesn't know what I'm going to do in the future because his love is not based on what you do. Now, look, stay with me. My son Delaney went through a stage when we lived in New Zealand where he did the exact opposite of what his father told him to do. I know none of your children do that, but mine did that. I told him not to play with the little boy toys in Sunday school. We were a small church. He had a friend. At that point in Delaney's life, he was more of a follower than a leader. And I said, man, don't... Don't follow, lead. And so when little Jason tells you to do things your dad's told you not to, trust me on this. Of course, he didn't. And so they call me after church, after I delivered my message one weekend. They said, Pastor Jeff, you better come downstairs. Your son has broken his arm. And sure enough, he was a big boy, but he rode in the little boy's little car. And he had his friend pushing him down the concrete, and the car just broke because Delaney was too heavy for it. And he fell out and he broke his arm. Now think about, what kind of father would I be if I went to Delaney and did this? You directly disobeyed me. I never want to talk to you again. What does dad do? A dad who loves. What does dad do? Son, let us reason together. (laughs) I told you that I gave these principles to you because I love you and I'm trying to protect you. You need to have faith in my faithfulness to you. If I cut off communication, I cut off life, love, and relationship, which is what I want most with my son, which is what God wants most with you. When you fail, you run to God, not away from him. There are things inside every one of you that you just hope and pray never get out. Come on. True. You're capable of doing things. That's why it's very you got to be very careful of judging other people. You have no idea what you would do in their shoes and in that circumstance. And the reality is that so many of us have something down deep inside that is so bad, if it ever gets out, you're going to stand back and say, wow, 
I cannot believe I was capable of doing that. I cannot believe I was capable of saying that. Listen again to the Apostle Paul's words. He says, but who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? Who condemn you? Nobody. Why? Because Christ Jesus died. And more than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God also interceding for you. Do you hear what he's saying? You're right with God, and there's nothing happening inside you that can ever change that love God has for you because you're not justified before God by being good. Christ died for you, and more than that, he's up at the right hand of the Father, and every time you mess up, God looks down and says, "Uh uh-oh, but Jesus says, don't worry, he's with me. His sins have been forgiven. There is nothing. I want you to, I want to make sure you get this because until you get this, you're never going to pray and you're never going to get intense in your prayers. So I want to make sure you get it. I want you to repeat it after me. God loves me no matter what bad stuff is happening inside me. I want to count of three. One, two, three. God loves me no matter what bad stuff is happening inside me. You are praying to a God whose love for you is unbreakable. Do you know why you have a hard time accepting that? Because it's not the way you love. <laughs> you're not God. Remember what I said, the biggest difference between you and God is he doesn't think he's you. <laughs> There's a beautiful passage in Deuteronomy 7 that has sustained me for so much of my life. And man, this is something it took a long time for me to learn because I grew up in a very rigorous, ritualistic, legalistic church. And that can suck the life right out of you. And it can give you a sense of arrogance that you're better than everybody. And hopefully one day God will wake you up. And in Deuteronomy 7, there's this kind of question that comes to God. Why do you love us? And God's response is classic. He says, and you can read it later. Just write this passage down. I want you to stay in Romans. In Deuteronomy 7, 7, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than all other peoples. In other words, not because you were grand. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loved you. And I'm going to stop right there. God used his circular reasoning almost in answering the question. He says, let me tell you why I love you. I love you because I love you. (laughs) You think about that. You think about that. I say to my wife, Robin, Robin, I love you. Why do you love me? Because I love you. (laughs) Right? But in reality, isn't that the only way to love? Because anything you fill in the blank with, that means that person who is the object of your love, their significance and security is going to be tied to whatever you filled in the blank with. Rob and I love you because you don't need Nutrisystem. (laughs) I'm still paying for that, just so you know. (laughs) Just so you know. Just so you know. Okay, Rob and I love you because your eyes are blue. I love you because your hair is short. I love you because whatever I say, when those things are gone then she's going to wonder if I still love her. The only appropriate response is, I love you because I love you. That's what God says. The other reason is because you and I in our culture do not believe that discipline and love can go together, and that's why many of your children are turning out the way they are. Okay, now I know what, don't please, no emails. I know a lot of, look, it doesn't matter who you are, at the end of the day, You only do the best you can as a parent and trust God for grace and mercy. I get that. But in God's mind, discipline and love go together. They're not inseparable. Hebrews chapter 12 says, because the Lord disciplines those the one he loves and he chastises or chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Now let me show you how this works. I'm going to show you a map. I want you to look at the map and it's going to stay on the screen until I lower my hand. This is a map. If you were going to go from Christ Church of the Valley in San Dimas down to Union Station... I want you to notice how many different roads you can take. There's so many different ways you can go, isn't there? Now the Bible says that God, as a child of God, if you're a child of God, God is gonna get you to Union Station or his end goal, okay? The road you take is gonna be entirely, or not entirely, but dramatically up to you. God is gonna get you there, that's his end. But the more you disobey, you're gonna be taking some side roads. And some of them are gonna go by the cliffs. And some of you are going to get to Union Station from San Dimas by way of Newport Beach. God will get you there. 
But every time you go down a road, he puts up a roadblock, tries to take you on another road. You go down that road, you go down the wrong way, he's going to put you on it. It's God's work in your life to get you down the road and ultimately to the destination because he loves you and he's never going to forsake you and there's nothing happening inside you that he will not continue to redirect till he gets you to your final destination. Do you understand that? God loves you and nothing separates Nothing happening inside you, nothing happening outside you, and this God cares about every moment of your life. Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? I don't know why there are some bad things that happen in your life. Sometimes they're roadblocks. Sometimes it's the discipline of God. Sometimes it's a sinful world. Even though I can't explain to you why these things sometimes happen, I know the reason it can't be. It can't be because God doesn't love you because he gave what was most precious to him, his only son. So therefore, will he not give you all good things? Okay. Who are you praying to? You're praying to a God who loves you as a father loves a son and does not give up on you. You're in, man. You're in the family. You're going to stay in the family. And he's not going to give up on you. And he cares about every situation in your life. But who can pray now? Oh, this is the big one. Who can pray? You say, well, all God's children. Aren't all people God's children? In one sense, yes. God is the father of all in the sense that Henry Ford is the father of the Model T and all Fords. God rest his soul. However, the word father in the Bible is much more than that. Father and a son. Son says to the father, you were never a father to me. You never taught me anything about life. You never gave me ways of instruction to be successful. You were never involved in what I was trying to accomplish. You were never a father to me. Hey, you're my own flesh and blood. Hey, it takes a lot more than that to be a father. You and I know that just because someone is my biological progenitor does not mean that he has a real father relationship to me. And the Bible takes the same path with the children of God. Children of God aren't merely those who come from God, but those who have been adopted into God's family by grace through faith. And here's why. God is holy. You are not. You have no right to be in the presence of God, but he provided a way through his son. His son died for your sins so that when God looks at you, all who come to Christ, all who come in humility, all who come by grace through faith, God sees you now as a fully adopted, all the rights and privileges, child of God. But not because of what you did. Not because you did something good, you went a week without telling a lie. But because God loved you so much, he wanted to give you the opportunity to come into his presence. The apostle Paul stretches the limits of language when he says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation, anything else in creation, it will be able to separate you from the love of God that is where? In Christ Jesus. This is not a universal promise. This is a promise to the children of God. Those who have come to God on God's terms, not their own. Those who have not come to God on the basis of religion, but on the basis of grace through faith. If you think you've earned the right to come to God because you're good or because you chant a few mantras or because you say the right words at the right time, folks, there's only one way to the Father. There is no other name under the heavens by which we are called to be saved. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I don't think Jesus was saying that just for your listening pleasure. He had a point to make. And the reason he can make that claim without being offensive is because that only Jesus died for your sins. Nobody else went to a cross. No one else was your sin bearer. And you know down deep inside that God is holy and that he is pure and he is righteous and the only way you come into his presence is by being the same. You can't be the same. And so rather than keeping the law perfectly and being deemed righteous by God, Christ paid your sins. And because he paid for your sins, God now sees you as righteous and worthy to enter into his presence. You say, Pastor Jeff, I have struggled with this. 
What about other forms of prayer? I see people at the airport down on their knees and they're praying and they're bowing. I see people, I see Hindus and on television on the Discovery Channel, Hindu chants and mantras. There's a lot of effort being made and you're telling me God doesn't hear them? Listen, when it comes to prayer, how loud you shout, how public your activities, how sincere your efforts, without truth, they are a mere exercise in futility. They may provide some sense of psychosomatic relief, but do they activate the hand and the energy and the power of God? Remember what happened in Elijah's day? Remember the prophets of Baal? They were pretty passionate. They were pretty serious. As a matter of fact, Elijah says, okay, let's see who the real God is. We built this altar. Now let's see whose God sends down fire. You go first. And hundreds and hundreds of prophets of Baal, what did they do? And by the way, anytime you see ancient uh, marks of the god Baal, he's always associated with a lightning rod. I think this is humorous because Elijah says, look, I'm going to give you the best chance possible. You're God of fire. I'm going to ask him to send down fire. <laughs> so go ahead, guys. Pray to your God. I'll wait over here. And what do they do? Oh, they're sincere. Oh, down on their Loud. Woo! For early in the morning all the way to noon, lunchtime. And finally, Elijah's getting bored. And he says, you'll have to shout louder. <laughs> for surely he is a God. Perhaps he is daydreaming or is relieving himself, or maybe he's away on a trip, or is asleep and needs to be awakened. Maybe your God suffers from irregularity. <laughs> maybe your God's on the toilet. Maybe your God suffers from D-A-D-D, -D, divinity attention deficit disorder. <laughs> and then verse 28, so they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until blood flowed. So they shout and they chant and they cut themselves. Nothing happens. To whom you pray is important. You're praying to the God, the creator and sustainer of all that is. And the only reason you can enter his presence is because you've become a child of God and you only become the child of God. You only become adopted into the family when you realize your sins separate you from God and there's only one who has bore your sin. And because of Jesus, you come into his presence. Now think about it. What does it really take? To, what would it take to go into the Oval Office and see the president? Okay? <laughs> what would it take? You, you'd, have to be a, you'd have to be a general or maybe a past president or financier, or maybe some great accomplishment if you won the World Series, or I'm sure Ohio State was invited in when they won the NCAA football championship. I'm sure that when Seattle wins the Super Bowl, they'll be invited into the <laughs> Oval Office. But what if you are, think about it, but what if you're one of the president's kids? What then? Don't you just waltz right into the Oval Office and sit on dad's knee and tell him what you want? Do you see what the Bible tries to help you understand about God? God is your daddy. He is your father. Yes, he's to be held in high regard and respect. But you have the right and privilege to walk in and sit on his knee and say, God, in the words of C.S. Lewis, don't bring before God what ought to be in you. Bring before God what is really in you. Because he's your father. And he has all the best intentions for you. Now, those are helpful. And those are obstacles that you're going to have to get. You've got to, res you've got to resolved, resolve that these things are true. You have to. You can't be double-minded that, that I'm not based, uh, that God does not listen to me more or less based on how good I've been. That's just arrogance on your part. That God loves me and he wants to talk to me, especially when I fail because he's pulling for me. He's in my corner and he wants me to succeed. But it's this fourth thing that I think that stands in our way and it's this. Do our prayers really make a difference? I mean, really. Is the future fixed? Or can I make choices that matter? Do my prayers impact the future? Now listen. Those of you who study philosophy, do you know what an antinomy is? An antinomy is what we call an apparent contradiction. It's kind of like light. Light can reveal itself in waves, but also in particles. And scientists look at that and say, well, how can that be? Well, it's not necessarily a contradiction, but it, it is... It's an anomaly. It's strange. How can God, how can God make sure and know the future and every event that's going to happen at a fixed point, and yet you and I pray and it impacts the future? 
One of my favorite authors says, God's response to our prayers is not a charade. He does not pretend that he's answering our prayer when he's only doing what he's going to do anyway. Our requests really do make a difference in what God does or does not do, does it? Listen, the God of the Bible is not like any other God. It's the God that says, you come to me. Let me give you just two examples. Now, we could do this for another hour. Aren't you glad we're not? But listen, Moses is up on Mount Sinai. He's receiving the Ten Commandments. And what are God's people doing? They're down in the valley. There's a massive orgy. Their hearts have turned back toward Egypt. They've created a golden calf. And God says, Moses, in verse 10 of chapter 32 of Exodus, now leave me alone, Moses, so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. God says, look, these people are hard-hearted. They're filled with disobedience. I'm going to start over just with you, Moses. And Moses enters in to one of the most instructive prayers in the Bible. And he says, God, wait a minute. This project of yours with your people, is it really necessary that it be defeated? Are you still not able to accomplish it? He's talking to God like this. Wait a minute, God. Think about this. Think about, th think about think telling God to think about this. Okay? Think about this, God. If you bring your people out here and you slaughter them, then the Egyptians are going to say, man, the, the God of the Hebrews is a mean God. He brought them all out in the wilderness just to slaughter them. Do you really want that God? And what about the promise you made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Would you destroy and them be consistent with your promise? Moses says in chapter 32, verse 12, turn from your fierce anger, God. Relent. That's a Hebrew word that is very clear. Go the other direction. That's what it means. Go the other direction. Do not bring disaster on your people. In verse 14, in response to Moses, then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. What about Abraham's prayer for the city? What about Hezekiah's prayer? Do you remember when Isaiah shows up and he's got bad news for the prophet? He comes into the throne. I got bad news, Hezekiah. What's that? The Lord says you will surely die. Well, I mean, is it like right now or later? <laughs> you shall surely die now. And Isaiah leaves. As soon as he turns to leave, Hezekiah does what Moses did. He turns his face to the wall. He weeps bitterly. And he says, God, you know I'm not a perfect man. But I've had an undivided heart, and I've tried my best. I've failed, but I've tried my best to serve you. And he pleads for his life. Isaiah doesn't even get out of the palace that God gives him another word. Okay, go back. And this is what I want you to say. And you'll find it in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 4 through 6. God says to Hezekiah, I have heard your prayer and have seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord, and I will add 15 years to your life. Wow, one prayer, 15 more years. God, the Bible says, can be prevailed upon by those who stand in his presence. There is nothing automatic and there is no formula. There is no silver bullet prayer that always gets the job done. Requests may be granted, they may not be. But the language of the Bible is that when his children pray, when his children pray, it moves the heart and the hand of God. The effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It releases God's energy. Look, think about Jesus in the garden. I don't think Jesus prays a prayer just for your benefit. In his humanity, Jesus said what? God, I know what the end goal is, and I know what you're trying to achieve. What I'm praying for is that there might be another way to achieve it. He says, if it's your will, if there's another road we can take to still get the end goal, God, then let this cup pass from me. Now, Jesus prayed that because he prayed that and he meant it. There wasn't another way because of the years and years of prophecy. This, was, this had to be the way, the exact way. And that's why Jesus said, but not my will, yours be done. Now, let me show you this map again. I'm going to leave it up here. This hopefully brings everything together. Look at the map again. It's going to stay there until my hand comes down. Look at San Dimas, and you want to go to Union Station, I ask you again to look at the many roads that you could take. Now listen, listen. God will bring everything to the end that he has desired, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. However, when it comes to your specific life, the road that he takes to get you there can vary based upon your prayers and God's willingness to respond. 
That's how they both work together. I mean, that is the miracle of God, that he can take all our free will decisions and all our prayers and still bring all of human history to the end fixed point. But prayer moves the heart and the hand of God. So pray for the cancer. Pray for your job. Pray for your spouse. Pray for your relationships. Pray that you get into that college. Pray that you pass. Pray. And when God hears God is smart enough and big enough to accomplish all of his plans and change the road in response to your prayers by the way he gets you there. Because as you're motivated by the burden of the heart and you sit on your father's knee and you pray, he begins to listen and he begins to hear. There are people in this room who have been healed of cancer. There are people in this room who have not been. I cannot tell you why. I am not God. But I can tell you this. You make a big mistake when you don't pray. And a lot of people will go through their entire lives with this thing underneath that says, you know what, my prayers don't make a difference. The end is fixed. Hey, the end of everything might be fixed, but your life can take different roads. And those roads will be in response to prayer and what God decides to do in your life. So please, as we start to pray, come to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. Listen, you can meditate and ruminate. You can even levitate if you want. But until you humble yourself and realize that you have no right to be in the Oval Office of God until your sins are forgiven and that only Jesus bore your sins on the cross, which is why I still believe it is the most recognized symbol in humanity, you cannot come to God. Sincerity is not what this is about, folks. This is about privilege and right to be in the presence of God and it comes through the Son. Understanding that nothing can separate you from his love. Nothing inside you, nothing outside you. God is not more or less attentive based on how good you were last week. Thank God for that. Amen to that. Amen. Boy, amen to that. And acknowledge that God is in control of the world and your life. Now listen, if you haven't seen the movie Unbroken yet, go see it. Fantastic movie based on the true story of Louis Zamperini, who grew up, I believe, in Torrance. A story about a hero The guy starts out a miserable life. He's a thief. He steals. He lies. He cheats. He does it all. Somewhere along the line, his older brother gets hold of him, starts to change him. He goes to war. He's lost at sea for 47 days. He's rescued by the Imperial Japanese Army. (laughs) He's tortured in concentration camps. He's abused. Everywhere he goes, The commander of the camp singles him out because they find out he was an Olympic runner. If they can break him, they can break everybody. Near the end of the movie, Louis is taken into the city and he's given nice clothes, three good meals, no more torture, no more pain, no more suffering. And all he has to do is go on Japanese uh, radio and tell the world, that the American war prisoners are being treated with respect and dignity. And as much as he wanted to live his life, the rest of it, because they said, if you will do this, you will have a nice clothes, you will have nice meals, and you will live out the war on Easy Street. But he couldn't do it. And he went back into the camps. Because as much as he wanted his prayer answered, there was something bigger that he lived his life for. The United States of America. And ultimately, God. And because of men like that, that, and women, that's why you can sit here and do what you're doing now. All of our prayers, God is attentive. He listens, he hears, he moves. And he changes the roads in response to your prayer, but he will get you to that fixed, determined point. But underlying all our prayers has to be the prayer of Jesus. Not my will, but yours be done. I live my life for a kingdom and a purpose greater than myself. If I summarize this message, it would be this. Pray. In three words. First word is pray. Second word, pray. Third word, pray some more. You say, how, how, how? And I say, come back next week, come back next week. 
Come back next week. <laughs> Father, we are so grateful for your goodness and your kindness. And uh, Lord, I just pray right now in Jesus' name uh, that you would open our eyes to the potential. We are starting to pray. We're just scratching the surface now. We know that. We must resolve some things in our mind. Help us to do so so that we can start to pray and then teach us how so that we can experience your love and a relationship with God our Father the way it was meant to be experienced. Go with us through this journey. Open our eyes to your truth and love. Change us from the inside out. And please, I pray that the Holy Spirit would do a mighty work right now. And anybody in this room that really believes that the love God has for them is based on how good they are, Open their eyes to the reality that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing happening outside us, nothing happening inside us. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.